All right. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. We're glad that you're joining us here. I'm going to switch from my computer glasses. And um, we are set live streaming our class this morning is canning as a culinary art. Um, I'm Kelly Corner. I am your health educator coordinating programs for the second act program. Uh, with me this morning, I have Mandy Robertson, our communications coordinator. Hi, Mandy. She's a couple doors down from me. I couldn't do this without her. Believe me, I can't do this without her. <laughs> I struggle bad enough with this with some technology, so don't feel bad today. We're going to work with it. Um, we are really excited this month of August. Um, I, I'm thrilled. I got actually a phone call saying we knocked it out of the park. Our second act newsletter has come out for the month of August. Thursday last week was the first date for scheduling and it has gone wonderfully. Um, we do have a few things that have filled up rather quickly, but this week we are looking forward to our canning presentation this morning. Um, those of you who are on with us, you will be able to scroll down below the presentation and type in any questions you may have for our speaker. Um, tomorrow we are going up to the Buzz in Benton and our coffee club, the Blue Ha Ha, will be meeting. And you are more than welcome to join us up there. It is in the newsletter at 8 a.m. Um, generally, we do run it at 8.30, but Mandy and I are going to be there. So you can join us at 8, 8.30. We're going to hang out, right? Part of the fun of our jobs. And then on Thursday, we have our making cookies. Um, we're very excited. We have original cookies coming in, or IE original, I believe is the proper title for them. And you're going to actually decorate cookies and get to take them with you. That will be here at our rehab entrance in Carterville. So if you want to, you can still call and register for that. Um, destinations this month we have listed in here. Um, we have our Cesar Opera House tour. Um, that's going to be fun. Of course, we're going to stop at the custard stand uh, after that. There's room for you there on Tuesday the 9th. Um, Thursday the 16th, we're going to do the late blooms. We're going to go back over to the Harmony Trail area at um, Crab Orchard and have our master gardener speak with us. Those of you who remember Kayla, our previous uh, person doing our communications, we're actually going to go watch her horseback riding and uh, competing. Uh, there's no fee for that. We're going to do that on Saturday, the 20th. Um, on Wednesday, the 24th of August, though, I'd really love to encourage you to join us at the Haven. We will be having a barbecue, nice picnic there, and just playing some yard games, getting an opportunity to get out and enjoy ourselves. So that will be nice. Um, classes this month. Um, I will be speaking. This will be our first time. We're going to go over to the Marion Senior Center, and I'll be presenting fairly well a class about eating like royalty, and that will be next Wednesday, the 20th of August, and we're going to be able to offer you when you register to eat their meal after that. Um, safety tips for traveling. We're going to go up to Illinois, uh, up to Benton area at the extension there, and we have a speaker. On safety tips for traveling, some of us are getting back into that mode. Um, we're having Robin back in. We just love Robin. Her series on keys to embracing aging. And you can join that series at any time. That will be on Friday, August 19th. Um, we're going up to Witten Wisdom at the Franklin County Senior Services Center. Um, this, again, is kind of a joint venture. We're going to have our speaker up there, um, Nick Housen, who's the chief meteorologist. And he will speak. And then afterward, you can register and join us for their meal. And then we will have Melise uh, Oakley, and she is from hospice talking about music and it's improving our cognitive function. That'll be one of the later ones on Tuesday the 30th. So we do have a full docket going for the month of August and we're excited to see you at all these places. Do remember our star groups? We have several of them, Haha, I mentioned. Um, we have our dining out group back this month. Um, they're going to be at Fujiyama's um, on Giant City Road in Carbondale. The hiking club is going to be at 10 a.m. on the third Monday of the month, which happens to be the August 15th date. And they're going to be at the Arrowhead Lake in Johnston City. That's about a two, two mile hike. And um, I've been enjoying that. I got to join them last time. So look at these. If you are interested in a star group, definitely would like you to join in on the fun and 
do an activity you enjoy with those that have a similar interest with you or just try something new. We uh, like our star groups and we're always trying to encourage people to participate in those. Um, let's see. Other things I need to mention. Do you have anything, Mandy? Did I skip something? Uh, yeah, just real quick. Our uh, Southern Illinois Airport tour and brunch is full. So that one sold out right away. We do have a waiting list going, though, that is getting a little bit long. But if you would like to be, join the wait list, we can still do that. But unfortunately, all the seats are full at this time. All right. And we will find what you like and what you're most interested in and try to do it again. Um, that always makes me happy when we get a, a busy day for Mandy on the phones. Sorry, but it's true. <laughs> she knows that. She knows that. All right. Well, without further ado, I do want to introduce our speaker today. We are very happy to have Susan Glassman with us. She is a nutrition and wellness educator with the University of Illinois Extension. Welcome, Susan. Thank you. Um, she is muddling through WebEx with us. She is more comfortable with Zoom, but for the sake of everyone we're used to and what we normally do, she's she is being a big trooper. So we greatly appreciate you doing that. She truly, folks, had no problem. She was able to bring up her presentation and roll with it right away. I'm the one who's technically going, yeah, cut and paste. Am I getting things in here right? So we greatly appreciate your skills and your talent, Susan. And I will let you take over with your presentation. Again, anyone, if you have questions, just scroll down a little bit below the presentation and you'll see a place to type that information in. Mandy and I will try our very best to make sure to spot those and to ask them at the end of the presentation. All right, Susan, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Kelly and Mandy. And thank you for inviting University of Illinois of Extension, of Extension to University of Illinois Extension to present. And today's topic is canning as a culinary art. I love canning. Um, I prefer water bath canning, and I have a lot of experience in that. Um, I also like to do freezer jams and refrigerator pickles. So I'll talk a little bit about that as we go through today. I did share some handouts with Carrie. And there it's all about canning. And then also there's two recipes for freezer, one's for freezer jam and one is for refrigerator pickles. So you can try to make that at home. And I thought instead of hauling all the equipment out, it might be easy if you visit a farmer's market and just want to preserve a couple things for the week um, that you could try those recipes. But we're going to dive in. And I do want to ask, do we have any seasoned canners in the audience. If you want to type it into the chat box, what do you like to can? And we'll see where we're at with everyone. And you're welcome to add that. I'll keep an eye on it and we'll keep moving forward. Um, with University of Illinois Extension, we do ask for some information during the time we do presentations. And if you would like to connect and add in our voluntary demographics, um, you can use your phone and do a screenshot and go right into the survey through the QR code, or there's the link on the screen. And I've shared the link in the chat box as well. I will send this to Carrie and she can send it out to everybody too. So we won't spend a lot of time on this, but that is part of what we ask for when we make our presentation. So I would like to say that University of Illinois Extension is the flagship outreach effort for University of Illinois. We are based in Urbana-Champaign, and we offer programs to all of our 102 counties um, that are research-based and scientific in evidence. And today we're going to talk about food preservation. I get really excited about this. It's summertime. The farmers markets are there. I have a few things I like to grow in my garden. Um, I love to do canning of jams and pickles. And I like to do it so that there's never a question. Um, I use the scientific trusted recipes. I use the National Center for Home and Food Preservation, which is out of the University of Georgia. They have a cookbook that's called So Easy to Preserve, and that's where I get all of my recipes from. 
you want to make sure that you're using safe methods and you never want to go through all of the work of canning and have that question pop up, right? Like, who did I do this? Did I do it for the right amount of time? Did I have what I needed for my ingredients? And you always want to use that to help guide you to preparing. And so with food preservation, we want to use what we've grown or we purchased and we don't want our food to spoil. Um, so that's where food preservation becomes so important during harvest season. You also have the option to prepare things the way that you like to. So if there's any dietary concerns, you can monitor sodium and sugar and you can add a lot of vegetables and have them ready for you to use for the, the winter season. It also helps us to save money and everyone knows how expensive groceries are right now. So if you have access to fresh vegetables and you can preserve them, um, it's a great way to, to save money on the budget. And then self-satisfaction. I enjoy canning and having things that I've made that I know are high quality to share with my friends and family. There are several ways we preserve foods. And I'm gonna go through stuff with you and then I'm gonna give you some information and you may explore a little bit more. Um, I will share my email with everybody at the end. And if you have questions, you're welcome to send me any questions you have. But food preservation is done through canning using a boiling water back canner or pressure canner. We'll talk about those today. And then also freezing and drying. But we're going to cover the canning part today. And with canning, we want to make sure that we're not giving any sort of open door of the environment for microorganisms to duplicate and grow. We want to make sure that things are safe and that those microorganisms are destroyed through the proper temperature. And that's what canning does for us. There's our water bath canner, which I prefer, um, and pressure canning. And in extension, we teach classes with water bath canning. Um, and this is generally used for fruits that are high acid foods, um, and it can be fruits and vegetables. And then pressure canning, which I'll show you a little bit more as we move down, is for lower acid foods. The difference here is the temperature. And for lower acid foods, you need a higher temperature to destroy those microorganisms so that there's no growth of bacteria um, in our food and everything is safe and preserved properly. So if we look at the difference between um, acidity and foods, the water bath canner would be places that we would can um, some berries, we might do some jams, uh, we might do some pickles, and those are foods that have enough acid to destroy any sort of germs and microorganisms. But if we look at the lower acid foods, those take a higher temperature. And that can be things like peas and corn and beans, green beans, potatoes, you can pressure pan meats. And if we look at the pH value, for the high acidic foods, it's over a 4.6 on the scale. Our low acid foods are higher than a 4.6. Um, so, so high acid foods are lower than 4.6 and low acid foods are higher than 4.6. And that's how we define what fits into each category. The one thing that we wanna start with when we're canning is good hand washing. And that's the first thing, and you want to do it frequently throughout your cleaning process. But have some hand soap and some warm water. Scrub your hands good for 20 seconds. Rinse them under that clean water, running water, and then keep a clean kitchen towel to dry them off before you start. And you also want to make sure that everything that you have ready to can in is clean. So we don't want a kitchen that stopped and cleaned like the picture with a sink full of dishes. We want to make sure that stuff's been cleaned and sanitized before we start. We want to wash all of our produce. If you cut your produce ahead of time, you want to refrigerate that. We want to wash our jars well and the rings and those go in hot soapy water. We want to make sure our countertops are clean and cutting boards and utensils and then sanitize everything before we begin. 
you can make your own sanitizer at home very simply by adding just a teaspoon of bleach to a quart of water. And you would spray that and let it sit for a minute and then wipe dry. But make sure that you're ready for everything. And with canners, um, you want to make sure that you're canning at the proper temperatures. So water bath canning destroys most yeasts and molds and bacteria, but you can see that water boils at 212. And that's the temperature we need for those foods, those, those high acid foods to be preserved safely. Pressure canning, on the other hand, there's one um, microorganism that we're really well aware of, and that's botulism. And sometimes we hear about that uh, with canning. And canning gives botulism spores the perfect environment for growth. Um, botulism spores require ant anaerobic without oxygen for them to multiply. And so if you're using your lower acid foods um, and you're not getting them up to the temperature to destroy botulism spores, you're offering them the perfect opportunity for growth. And you can see the difference in temperatures between these two canning methods. We really talk a lot about botulism um, because it is a naturally occurring bacteria that's found in the soil. Um, it forms cells and those cells, those spores can grow during the canning process. And it, rap it multiplies rapidly and it produces harmful toxins. So you want to make sure that we can safely. Um, botulism can potentially be deadly. And food does not show any signs of botulism. There's nothing to say that it has the toxins in it. It looks perfectly normal. Um, but when we do see cases of botulism, it takes 12 to 72 hours for symptoms. And some of those symptoms include blurred and double vision. It could be difficulty with swallowing or speaking and breathing. The other thing I want to emphasize is using good trusted recipes when you're canning. That's where I like the So Easy to Preserve book from University of Georgia from the National Center for Home and Food Preservation. I'm putting together some things that we recommend not to do. Um, and then we also have information that you'll be getting in your handout with what to do. But there may be times that back in the past, there's been canning done by just putting the food in jars, putting the lid on, turning it upside down, sitting it on the counter. The lid actually seals. Um, it feels like it's sealed well, but as you go through the winter, it may not stay sealed. And so that was the open kettle method. There's also ways that um, our alternative methods, which we're gonna go down to on this slide, and you want to be careful of things that I see on Facebook. Um, I've seen dishwasher canning. I've seen um, slow cooker canning and sun canning, microwave canning. Uh, back, back in the day, you were able to use paraffin wax um, as a seal instead of processing. That's something that's an out of date method. And then just a one piece lid. And you also want to only use the proper canning jars. So old like mayonnaise jars and jars that we have that we have food in from the store are not proper canning jars. So make sure that you have your canning jar, your mason jar with your lid and your ring to secure it. And before 1989, um, there were different methods used for canning. Our safer recipes are older than 1989. Um, or they're younger, I'm sorry. They're after 1989, let me be clear. Those that are before 1989, we don't recommend anymore. And that's because we've learned and we've researched and we have the science to back us that the time for processing is different. Food is also different. So. Having your grandmother's recipes for canning are wonderful. And I love looking at my grandmother's recipes, but they're not the ones I use any longer. Food has changed in acidity and canning times have changed. So make sure that you're using a current recipe. 
things that I see that I kind of stay away from um, people's blogs and cookbooks that I've seen from the churches or handwritten recipes from family members are all that give us great ideas for canning and give us the resources but then take it and move it forward to a current recipe that's been tested. And that would come from the So Easy to Preserve book. You can also use anything from USDA. You can use recipes from University of Illinois Extension or the land grant extension system. And then Ball and Kerr and SureGel um, are all scientifically tested recipes that you can use. So be careful with the start, like I said, this is the foundation and I, I don't want to have that question mark like, did I do this correctly and have 24 jars of something sitting on the counter and then have to call the extension office and ask if it's gonna be okay. So we get a lot of phone calls about canning and people that have canned things and they're like, did I follow the direction I'm gonna call? And most times we'll say, we cannot say yes. So, so always follow good directions. Um, here's some examples of canning jars. So there's the mason jar. There's jars you buy at Walmart in the canning section or Farm and Fleet or your stores. Um, but you want to make sure that you have the proper jar that you need. For jams, there's different sizes for jams and pickles and even juices for apple juice. So you want to make sure that you get the proper size. And then you're going to have your lids. Um, and your rings, and you can reuse your jars, but you cannot reuse the lids, but you'll keep the jars and the rings. And so here's a picture of the lid. You can see there's some glue around the edges, and that's made to seal one time. Um, and that glue seals to the glass, and it keeps it safe um, for the season. And you can use your canned goods for about a year after you can them. Um, with your jars, you want to make sure that they're sterilized. Now, this is where you can use a dishwasher. You can put them through a dishwashing cycle and leave them in the dishwasher at a warm temperature and pull them out to use them. You also can put your jars into your canner, into the hot water, and let them sit till you're ready to use them. You always want to make sure that you're using hot jars with hot liquids and contents. You never want to use a cold jar um, with a hot liquid. And when they're in hot water, you know that they're being sterilized and they're ready to use. And so that's a good practice to have. And then when we fill jars, we have to follow the rules for headspace. And you might have one of the little headspace measures with your canning supplies. That's probably my favorite part. And my favorite part to teach in classes is teaching how to measure headspace. Um, in the picture here, you can see that the headspace is the unfilled space between the lid and the food. And you want to make sure that you properly measure that. And I usually use a funnel to put my contents in the jars. And you get to know after a couple of jars of putting your, your food in about how many ladles will fit in your jar and you can go really quickly. The first couple will take some time to measure your headspace, but your headspace is very important because that um, can open up room for, for food to spoil if you don't have the proper headspace. You want to make sure, and I like to share these pictures, that you wipe the rims of your jars before you're going to put the lid on. Sometimes there's things that we process that are high sugar or have higher fat, and that can um, stop the lid from adhering to the glass. And so you want to make sure that you wipe it off good. I use a warm towel. Some people put a little vinegar on the towel and you wipe it around the rim. And then you want to free the bubbles and that little green tool um, is just like a little end of a spoon and it goes down to the bottom of the jar and it removes all of the oxygen bubbles. And that lets us have the proper headspace that we need for preserving. If there was a lot of oxygen in the jar, it would change the headspace. So always make sure that you free the bubbles and then secure your lids. And with putting your lids on, you're going to put your lid on, 
and your screw and you're going to do one tug snug. So you're just going to screw it until you feel it stop. And I call it one tug snug. And you just kind of go and you get the feel for it. Um, but that you don't want to put your ring on too tight because then the oxygen cannot be expelled during the cleaning process. Here's a picture of our water bath canner. And I have um, a water bath canner, but what you need is a covered pot and a rack. So if you don't have a big, huge water bath canner and you have a nice stock pot or like an eight quart soup pot and a little rack fits in there, it's fine to use that. You don't have to have the huge equipment that that this is showing, but when you're panning, you're usually processing quite a bit of food. So most people do have this, um, but you want to put your jars in the rack and then you're going to add them into the canner and you can see that you want your water to be 1 to 2 inches above your jars and always measure that um, because that allows for your water to boil in your can um, in your canner. And it gives you the proper temperature that you're getting. And you can see here's a picture of someone putting some jars in their canner. When you process in the boiling water bath canner, you want to process when a full rolling boil is reached. Then you start your timer and you keep it at a full rolling boil until your time is up. Then you turn off your um, your heat and you remove the lid and let your child sit for five minutes and cool a little bit. And that's a very important step. You don't want to ever be too quick and be impatient with canning. It takes time. And follow your directions for processing time. Each jar is different times. Each recipe is different times and too little time can be result in spoilage and it's very expensive to put together um, all of our garden produce and can it. It's, it's expensive in ingredients and it's also expensive in time. So you want to make sure that you're following the directions. And so here we have pressure canning. And this is where we have those low acid foods like beans and corn are some of the pictures that I'm showing. Um, this we need to bring those foods up to a higher temperature to kill any microorganisms, which include those botulism spores. And so this canner is a little different. And I'm going to show you a few pictures of it. Most of what I covered today was water bath cleaning. But this is a picture of our modern pressure canner. Now, University of Illinois Extension, we offer free pressure canner testing. And we recommend that canners with the gauges that you can see in this picture are tested annually. And sometimes I have people come with canners that have been in their family for generations and you still can use them as long as the seal is good and you have a good gauge. Sometimes you'll see a canner just with what they call the jiggler. And the jiggler doesn't need to have any testing. Um, you want to make sure your seal is good, but you don't need to test it like you do the bleach. But our modern pressure cleaners have some safety features built in. They're very lightweight aluminum, and you can see that there's the removable vents. Um, there's the locket, and then there's an air vent. There's also the pet pack that we cover. And so there's safety valves that are built in and it feels a little better. Back in the day, you may have heard someone say that the pressure canner exploded or that this happened in the kitchen. We don't see that with modern pressure canners. So it's, it's a lot different now. And the one thing that we check is we check the gauges and then here's a picture of the seal. And you wanna make sure the seals on the canner are soft and pliable. If they're hard and cracked, you want to order a new seal. And most seals can be found online. Um, you can go at presto.com or there's some stores in the area that carry those supplies. You can see that when the canner is loaded with the jars, 
it's going to take time to come up to temperature before you start your time. And so you're going to boil and get steam coming out of your canner for 12 to 15 minutes. And then you're going to process it at the pressure um, it requires. A lot of times it's 10.5 or 11, but you want to keep it at that pressure and maintain it for the entire time your food is processing. If you notice that your pressure decreases and there's not steam coming out of the canner, then you restart that whole time again. And you never leave your canners unattended in the kitchen. Um, when they're working, you're there with them, um, working alongside to maintain that safety. And this is how the food the jars look in our canner. And you can see that in this canner, there's not as much water. And so this canner operates with high heat and steam, but there's two to three inches of water at the bottom of the canner. And with our boiling water bath can, remember there was two inches at the top. So they're very different in planning method. After you're done, um, this is a fun part. We look in the canner and the water's done boiling and we take those jars out. And the first thing that we want to do is we want to get the water off the tops. <laughs> we want to tilt it a little bit and get the water poured off that's not something we recommend. You're gonna take it out and you're gonna put your jars on a rack and you're gonna let it sit. The water's gonna sit on top. Don't worry about that. That's gonna be something you clean up later. But if you tilt it, you can have those ingredients come up and they can compromise that seal. And so this is one of the most important parts. And then you're gonna cool your jars. And when you cool your jars, they're going to sit on the counter for 12 to 24 hours. You're not going to touch them. So you're going to leave them overnight um, and you're going to come back the next day and you're going to check to make seal that. Make sure that your seals have adhered. If you notice that your, your um, canning has not sealed your canners, you can reprocess within 24 hours or you can refrigerate and use. But if it's two or three days that's gone by, we're not going to recommend that you save that food. So this is an important step. And here you can see the jars. You want your seal to be concave. You should not be able to push onto the seal and feel it popping up and down like you did before um, that goes in the canner. Some people take a spoon and they hit the spoon on the seal and they'll hear a high pitched sound. I just press with my finger and I can tell that it's sealed. And you want that concave seal um, on your lid to know that it's safely preserved. And then you're gonna store your jars. So I store my jars in a cool pantry. Um, it shouldn't be above 70 degrees, so a home temperature. You can store them downstairs if you have a basement for storage for your, for your food preservation but you don't want to store the bands on, on those jars. And this is probably the part that you have to get used to the most is we all want to have the bands and for the jars to look pretty, right? Um, but you take those screw lids off and your, you, you take the ring off and your lid stays adhered. It does not need that ring to maintain its adherence to the bones. Um, and sometimes water remains under those rings and it can get rusty. And so it can rust around the lid. So for safety, we take the rings off and then we store in a cool, dry place. You want to use your food preservation within a year for best quality, for best quality. And you want to use it before the next season, right? You don't want to have five years worth of stuff down in, in your storage. That's way too much. So make it a point to make sure that you use things or you share them. Um, with family and friends. And here, what else can you do for family? And I wanted to add this part, and this is this is my part that I I have the most fun with, because with canning, um, we use specific recipes and ingredients. You follow the measurements. You have to make sure that you do things according to that recipe for safe canning. But if you're doing some things on your own, like some refrigerator pickles. This is where I have a little bit more fun. I 
I here have some jars of some red onion and cucumber refrigerator pickles that I made. And I boiled um, some vinegar and some sugar, and I added some celery seed and some mustard seed. And then I poured that liquid over the vegetables in the jar, and it goes into the refrigerator for a couple of days. You can also just put it in a bowl in the refrigerator, and you're going to eat it within a week or two. It's not a long term type of thing. It doesn't ever come out of the refrigerator and go on the pantry shelf. But here, I also will add in some of my other vegetables that I have from the garden. I might add in some red pepper strips or some carrots. I might throw in a hot pepper or some pepperoncinis. And there you can kind of make a mixture. And it's not anything that you're going to have to worry about. You would never do that with canning. Um, you would follow your recipe to the T. But here you can take that culinary artistic license um, and have a little bit of fun with your canning. And this is where I'll go to the farmer's market and get a couple of cucumbers and some onion and, you know, throw a couple things that I have in the fridge in there. And I'll pull it out for dinner and I'll eat the whole jar. So it goes fast. It won't stay in there. This is where you may have your grandma's recipes or the refrigerator pickles that you make each season. And so the refrigerator can is a little bit different and offers a little bit more variety um, in things that you like to add to it. And then if you like to do jams, um, try freezer jam. And we did this last year in a workshop and it was delicious. The jams are so good. You can put them in some containers and keep them in the freezer for up to a year. Um, you can do mixed berries if you want. And so that's just another way to enjoy summer's bounty. Um, and the recipes that I, I gave to Kelly, there's one for freezer jam and one for refrigerator pickles. So I hope that you'll enjoy trying those. And here's the, the resources I want to share with you. That's the So Easy to Preserve book. I have that on my shelf at home, and I have one on my shelf here in the office. And if people call and ask us questions, we'll go to the National Center for Home Food Preservation website. And that's really the extension resources that we turn to the most. We also use the USDA Complete Guide to Home Planning. And so those are really good trusted resources that, that we teach in our classes and that we recommend um, that are used for community. And so those I have, I also am going to pop past here and let you see that we do have some canning videos that are available on YouTube. And you can learn how to pressure can green beans. You can can tomatoes. You can do strawberry jam. And they're only two minutes long. So um, that's my work colleague, Mary Liz Wright. But it's under what's cooking with Mary Liz Wright from the University of Illinois Extension. And I was going to try to show a few videos to you today. I was not able to, but I hope that you go into YouTube and watch it. And I guarantee if you watch one, you'll go through the whole loop and watch them all because there's a lot of great videos for things that you can make at home. We also have our Around the Table Facebook and we'll feature canning recipes there. And then University of Illinois Extension website is a great place to look as well. There's a lot of food preservation resources. So I hope that I shared some information that you can use today. And um, if you ever would like to ask a question, you can email me. My email is susang at illinois.edu. And you're welcome to email with any questions. Well, thank you. Well, thank you, Susan. We're so grateful that you were able to cover that. I found it very interesting, um, but we didn't get our live stream starting right away as we had hoped. So I was going to ask you if you'd sneak back to maybe the first, you know, five or six slides for us. So I'm just sure. do a little quick uh, <laughs> review. <laughs> yep. Let's pop right up here. Thank you. Jump button and okay. So there we go. yeah, so so we talked about food preservation 
And I do want to thank you because I want to make sure everybody gets this information. It's so important. Um, I know right now groceries are so expensive. So if you can work on preserving some of your foods from getting them from farmers markets or gardens, um, if you have a garden, it's going to help save money. And it also helps us enjoy our bounty of the season without it spoiling. And so food preservation lets us use what we've grown and purchased for a long term. And it's also very satisfying to preserve your own foods. You also can monitor any dietary concerns, so there might be salt or sugar, um, and you can make some of your own foods that fit those, those needs. And then we did talk mainly about canning today, but we have four food preservation methods that we recommend, which is canning, freezing, and drying. And canning, there's two methods. There's the water bath canner and the pressure canner. And both of these methods, when the food is in the jar and they're put in the canners, they heat them to the temperature that destroys any microorganisms or enzymes. So there's no spoilage. And it makes the food safe for us to store on the shelf to eat for the season coming up. And here, our boiling, water, our boiling water bath cleaner and our pressure cleaner, they're very different methods. Um, our boiling water bath cleaner, I was saying, that's the one I use the most. That's where you would make your pickles, your tomatoes, your jams. And then our pressure cleaner would be for our garden vegetables like green beans and corn. It can can meats, so poultry and, and meats and seafoods and mixed canned foods. And I'm going to show you the difference here because this is important to know what food you have and what canner it goes in. And the difference is in the heat, but for a water bath canner and a pressure canner, there are different acidic levels in foods. And so for water bath canning, it's for our higher acid foods that will be able to um, be heated at a lower temperature and not have any bacterial growth. And it could be like our berries or our jams and our pickles. It can be tomatoes. With tomatoes, we do add some, some acid to it with our recipe, but, but it can be put into the water bath canner. And these are foods with a pH value of 4.6 or less. They're high acid foods, but then pressure canning our foods, foods that are lower acid that need a higher temperature to fill any microorganisms or spores. It can be for green beans and peas and corn. It can be for meats or mixed vegetables. Some people do soups. And these are pH values that are higher than 4.6 and a lower acid. So you have to make sure that you're using the correct canning method for your food. And good hand washing, um, we covered. Make sure that you have warm water and a big thing of soap by the sink because you're going to wash your hands a lot when you're canning. But you want to make sure you lather well and you get the backs of hands and fingers and nails and get the soap on there for 20 seconds. We always say it takes 20 seconds to get into all these little lines. And to be able to fill all the little germs that love the moisture of our hands and the warmth, it's the perfect environment for germs. Um, rinse well under clean water and then towel dry and keep a towel by the sink just for drying your hands. And then here, I think I'll stop. Is this good to go through this one, Kelly? Yeah, okay. Um, make sure that you prepare things and get them ready ahead of time. When you're canning, there's a, a process that you go through and there's times that you go through. And so you can see the picture here. Here's the kitchen after dinner <laughs> with dishes in the sink and stuff not cleaned up yet. You want to make sure that your kitchen's clean when you start canning. Um, you want to make sure that your countertops have been sanitized. Your cutting boards are clean. Your utensils are clean. Your jars are washed and everything's been washed in soapy water. You want to wash all your produce before you get started. And then if you cut things ahead of time, keep them in the refrigerator. They don't sit out at room temperature. 
And you can even make your own sanitizer at home by using one teaspoon of bleach to a quart of water. And you put that onto your countertops or your contact service. And you can air dry. Or you can use it with a single use towel. So, but making sure that your kitchen's clean and ready is really important. And then I think that's about where we need to be. So I appreciate you so much for going back through there. Um, with COVID and everyone looking at you know, doing things at home and having a little bit more time for some of them um, to be at home and do things. I know the big thing was, you know, making your own breads and then, you know, all this other stuff people have been trying. Um, one of our questions asked um, concerning keeping things clean, um, and, and I think you just answered it there with using a bleach solution, but would you recommend a certain um, product, um, I guess they're inquiring about, for making sure all surfaces are clean? So we recommend a bleach solution or a bleach wipe to make sure that things are clean. Yeah. Okay. It's easy to buy bleach and just make your own. You, I make my bleach solution every day. You want to make sure that you you don't let it sit for a long time because the bleach will dissipate. So, but a bleach solution or a bleach wipes is perfectly fine to use. Okay. Um, another question was concerning all of these recalls. Um, you know, if you try to do things yourself, and like you said, it can be really expensive as far as money and time-wise, um, what would you say would be like the top three things to make sure that your canning goes well so that you don't have to throw it out or be worried about a recall? <laughs> it would be like your own recall. <laughs> So making sure that you wash your produce, um, that you sterilize your jars, and you follow a trusted recipe and can according to that direction. So um, those are the things that we recommend. And when people call us, we'll say, you know, what, how did you can it? What was your recipe? Uh, and so those are the big things to follow. And if you follow those directions, you're going to be fine. Okay, follow up to that, you say wash your fruits and vegetables first. What would you wash those in? Do you recommend them soaking them with a little bit of vinegar? Um, obviously, I wouldn't think bleach, but you tell me. No, we don't need to use anything. Just cool running water. And you can use a little brush to make sure all your soil is removed off of your produce before you can it. Um, but just cool running water is all that you're going to need. And I know people ask me that all the time, and they'll use vegetable washes that they buy. Some people will use vinegar. Some have asked me before if they can use soap or bleach, but you don't. You just need to wash it with cool running water. Wonderful. Um, we did have a couple. Oh, I'm you. sorry. We we did have a couple other questions. Um, we had one uh, wanting to know what do you think about the electric pressure cookers for uh, canning. That's a great question. So we don't recommend them. Oh, and um, there, there's not been enough research for um, our resources to say that we recommend it safely. And there's a difference between a pressure cooker and a pressure canner. And through the presentation, when I showed you our pressure canner, let me go down to it there. Um, you can see it's a much different piece of equipment. We're watching our gauge. We're adding it so that we create that steam seal. And we're processing for the time that we know we need with that recipe. And pressure canning, I'm very careful with because of botulism. And I follow those trusted recipes to the T. So, so it's not recommended at this time. Interesting. Um, the other question was when we're talking about those uh, those older recipes that we all have. So, what are the things that we should be looking for in those recipes that might need to be updated? Yeah, that's a really good question too. So, I'll give the example of tomatoes, and 
back in the day, you used to be able just to put your tomatoes in the, you know, skin your tomatoes, put them in the jar, add your water, put your lid on and process. But tomatoes, there are such different varieties now and such different acidities that our trusted recipes will ask that you'll use your tomatoes, but then you'll add two tablespoons of lemon juice concentrate. Um, and those are all updated as well as they've learned a lot about processing times and temperatures. And so anything past 1989, they don't recommend. Um, you're gonna need to upgrade to something more current with, with your canning recipes. Kelly, do you have anything else? So say any other questions, but I think we've covered it very thoroughly and I really appreciate Susan, the, the visuals. Um, for me, seeing that two inches above or only two to three inches below um, really helps highlight the difference um, between a water bath and an actual um, pressure canner. So that was very, very helpful, especially for someone who's maybe going back to doing this after having not done it for many, many years, which would be me, um, <laughs> to go, oh yeah, I remember when my mom did, oh yeah. So I yeah. really appreciate you explaining that everything um, has been, I, I guess the term modern. Um, we've modernized our canning processes to be safer and um, to be even healthier for us with what we can put in. Um, so I really appreciate your time today. Um, any last comments you may have? I enjoyed being able to share this with everyone. I hope that you all enjoyed it. And thank you for inviting University of Illinois Extension to come and talk about canning today. Remember, we have lots of great resources. So if anyone has any questions, you're welcome to email me. It's Susan G, S-U-S-A-N-G, at Illinois.edu. Thank you so much. Mandy is fantastic about putting things out on our Facebook. So as long as you are okay with that, we will post a couple of these sites that you referred to and recipe books you recommend. And we greatly appreciate your time today. This is very timely because right now is literally beginning season, correct? Yeah. It's the perfect time to have this class. So for that, if you're not putting all the equipment out and going through all of the canning, it's a lot of work. Some of you may be past that. Um, you also can just do something in the fridge or the freezer and stuff. And I will make those <laughs> recipes available. Um, we'll have some copies if people need us to actually mail them, or I will be able to get that information to Mandy to post also. They're very helpful. They're nice and bright colored and very well written so that we can follow the instructions easily. And uh, again, Susan, I greatly appreciate your time today. Um, I think I'll stop our live streaming here in a second and then stay here and I'll do a closing chit chat, all right? Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.